Greetings, everyone. This is the original Cooking Duels. So I say original because I think some people might copy this. So first a word here about American English versus British English. So, you know, it's amazing, you know, when you consider a country like India, which has seven major languages, you know, like every big city in India speaks a different language. You know, all the, you know, New Delhi, Mumbai, all the cities that are good size are in different areas of the country and they speak different languages. And the only way they can understand each other is to speak English. That's why Indian people speak English. Plus, it's the only language taught in universities. So if you want to go to school, <laughs> you better speak English and high schools now. So, but, you know, the world speaks just a language they call English. And there's little differences between British English and American English. And not much so. You know, it's all like one language. So I just wanted to say a few words here about, you know, some of the differences. If you watch YouTube videos and you see like, a, you know, British people and American people and they're, you know, getting together, discussing the different words, you'll find that there's, there's only like a dozen words or maybe 15 that are different. And they always talk about this is one of them, trunk. So if you look at the Cambridge Dictionary on the right, it says a large, strong container that is used for storing clothes and personal possessions, often while traveling or going to live in a new place. So like on the Titanic, people that were moving to America, which there were a lot of people on the Titanic and like the third class <laughs> sections that were moving. Other people were just, you know, taken off to New York for a while. Um, so they would pack all their clothes in the trunk if they had, you know, more clothes than what they're wearing on their back. And on the left, we have the second definition. On the right, by the way, there's, you know, there's tree trunks, there's trunks in, you know, the artery systems and stuff like that. There's all in elephant trunks. There's all kinds of definitions of the word trunk. On the left, all kinds of definitions of the word trunk in American English, too. Only, uh, you know, this, the, the highest one was, uh, you know, the trunk of a tree. I think that was the same for the British. And number two is a piece of luggage, you know, a rigid piece of luggage, usually for transporting clothing and personal effects. So these are just big wooden boxes with brass trim around the outside so they, that the wood doesn't get damaged in the corners and the, and the sides. And they're really heavy duty. Also in American English, the luggage compartment of an automobile. So these, the two pictures on the top are 19... 30 American luxury cars. The one on the left is a Duesenberg, and the one on the right is a Pierce Arrow. So these would be, I don't know what the model numbers are called, but these would be the large touring cars as opposed to a sports car of the day. <laughs> so, and as you can see in the early days of cars, as cars started getting more developed and more reliable and people started traveling further in them, they needed a place to put clothes and there wasn't a place in the original, you know, like the Ford Model T or Model A, there was no place to store your clothes. So they made a little platform in the back where you could put a trunk. And on the car on the right, the um, Pierce Arrow, you could see the, the trunk is covered in a material that also covers the spare tire and the, the roof. It's a convertible car. And on the left, you can see a trunk that's a little more like aerodynamic, kind of goes with the shape of the car. And, you know, that's on the Duesenberg. So then the bottom picture is just two years later, 1932. And this is a Duesenberg. These, these old cars are really cool. <laughs> you know, they're, they're just so, they're beautiful. They're works of art, you know. And um, I, I looked at cars and... Europe too, and, and England, and you know, all the cars followed about the same stuff. You know, in 1932, basically, they had a built in trunk. So in America, we just continued to call this a trunk. It's the area of a car where you open up the back and put your stuff in, <laughs> your clothes, and other things. So, and in Great Britain, <laughs> they call this thing at the back of the car a boot. So that's one thing that you notice when you're watching YouTube videos and watching, you know, Americans and Brits uh, go back and forth with some friendly 
banter about, you know, British English and American English. This is one thing where they say, well, yeah, that makes a little bit more sense in America because it's a trunk <laughs> instead of a boot. Boot doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But anyways, this is one example where, you know, British English and American English differ a little bit. And people don't realize this, but, and I couldn't find it in writing again, but I know I've read this many times, is the, uh, the English language that's used in the world today is mostly American because we've added more words than the British. You know, we don't ask the British, hey, you know, we need to add, uh, you know, space shuttle to the English language or microprocessor or smartphone, you know. We just add words, you know, and they become part of the English language, you know, and actually most of the words in the English language are American. So that's, you know, one reason for learning American English. So um, I just wanted to explain the reasoning behind naming this channel. So in Merriam-Webster, if you look up, you know, the word duo, and you just say definition duo. Then you come to Merriam-Webster Miriam, and you'll see a section at the top where there's like, you know, five or six different definitions of the word duo. And if you scroll down, you'll see English language learners definition of duo. So I don't know if this is just American English or the British do it too, but some powers that be in the English language world decided that new learners of the English language should learn just, you know, not all 10 different de definitions of a word like trunk, just the most common one. So duo, the most common one, is two people who perform together or usually seen together are associated with each other, a duo of two people. So if, for example, you were going to get on a video call with somebody on the other side of the world, or maybe your you know, doctor, I did a doctor's appointment during the COVID height, and uh, you know, we were on a video call, you wouldn't call yourselves a duo because you're not associated with each other, not usually seen together. So that wouldn't work for that. A duet is music related. So that's the definition of duet that they want you to learn first as a language, English language learner, is that duet means something that has to do with music. It's either two musicians together or two singers. You know, you might have a uh, cello and a violin together. You might have two different, you know, a singer, um, you know, somebody with a deeper voice and a higher voice singing together. So that's a duet and it's music related. And then a duel, <laughs> dual. Um, in the English language, they want you to learn two different definitions. One is a fight between two people with weapons, you know, with such as guns or swords. That's a duel. That's kind of an archaic thing because duels just don't happen anymore. <laughs> and the more, a more common thing is a situation with, with, in which two people compete with each other. So that's why I call this channel Cooking Duels because we're not going to be duets. You know, it's going to be me and some random girl on the other side of the world. And, you know, a random girl because, you know, I'm a guy. I like girls better <laughs> than guys. So, and I have, have a lot of, uh, you know, lady contacts in Asia from, from working over there and from, uh, you know, making, you know, contacts. And I, I just like Asian ladies. So that's what it's going to be most of the time is a cooking duel between me and some Asian lady who is teaching me how to cook some Asian dish. And then occasionally I'll swap around and teach the Asian lady how to cook something American or something that I cook and they don't. So the original cooking duels, you know, not, you know, this is, you know, what they still have is a number one definition for the learner's version is, you know, some kind of fight with weapons, but we're not going to be fighting with weapons. So none of that stuff, and we're just going to be dueling with cooking utensils and pots and pans and ingredients and food. So that's the kind of duel that we're having. So it's going to be me in the U.S. of A. and some girl somewhere. Now I've already made some videos, and I haven't published them. And the reason I haven't published them is because 
either the audio or the video or the lighting on the other end just isn't up to speed yet. So we've made some videos that actually look good and kind of sound good. And then when you play it back, you know, you can't hear the lady because she's not using a lapel mic or, you know, you can hear noise in the background better. Um, you know, just haven't gotten one right yet. And I'm thinking about going outside my contact network and finding, and I've already done this actually, found a Japanese girl and a uh, Chinese girl who both have cooking channels that have very few followers, like, you know, like a hundred. <laughs> so that's beneficial to them. They've already, you know, they've already made a cooking video and maybe it's pretty good. Maybe they use decent cameras and decent, you know, film speed or different, not film, but, you know, different frames per second and they, they have good lighting and good microphones. So I have some of those girls lined up, but I didn't, I didn't practice with them yet. I've only practiced with some girls that, that are, that we, you know, we've been talking about cooking for a long time. So me on the left, this is uh, me in my kitchen. <laughs> so I happen to have a pretty good setup and I have another video that shows my kitchen and it just happens to be good for this kind of stuff. On the other end, I don't know what we're going to run into yet, but we're going to have, I have the European Union and the, um, you know, Southeast Asian countries to begin with, but I also have, you know, China and Japan. So I don't think there's a flag or a symbol for all of Asia. <laughs> Maybe there is, I don't know. So the first call we're going to be, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be making a call to the other person, to the lady, to talk about ingredients first. You know, after a couple emails back and forth, hey, do you want to try to do this? And okay, I'm going to need to call you. We'll go over ingredients. So that could end up being interesting and it could not. So I don't know if that's going to be part of the video or, or whether that I'm going to make a video out of that. I, I will for my purposes because that's how I take notes you know, for cooking, I'll just say, okay, I need this crazy spice and, you know, some of this stuff and some crazy fish sauce that I don't have. Um, you know, and I'll try to get what the ingredients that they're using on the other end. So I'll record it. Whether or not I publish it is yet to be seen. So I wanted to talk here about the first cooking duel. <laughs> and these are this is a former girlfriend. We lived together in Shanghai for, you know, a long time. And uh, these are just terrible pictures of her. We always we always joke because when we take a picture together, she doesn't look really good. Um, but she's really beautiful. <laughs> she doesn't have high cheeks, um, you know, but these are pictures of us. So anyways, uh, this is what we use as the original cooking duel. We used to cook together all the time. You know, we'd take turns cooking or I'd help her cook and, you know, every, every day. But then we usually would, you know, it's so cheap to eat in China that you go out, you know, and dinner is only going to cost a few dollars a piece, especially, you know, typically in China, you're living somewhere in a high rise and then the bottom floor of the high rise might have a bunch of shops where you can buy fresh vegetables and fresh fruit and fresh meat and fresh everything. And there's people cooking down there in the bottom level too. So, you know, that's, that's like the first place we stayed in. The, the last place we stayed in, which, you know, there's no pictures of places here, um, was real high end. So they didn't have any shops on the bottom floor. But, you know, it's food is so cheap, it's, you know, you go out to eat all the time. But when you do cook together, you know, we used to just share cooking duties. So this is just something I thought I'd throw in here because I found these pictures <laughs> when I was looking for things. <laughs> this is her. I, she's not smiling here. And she's, you know, she's not smiling in the first set of pictures either. But, um, you know, she happened to turn around in the kitchen once with a spatula. She looks like she's mad. <laughs> But she doesn't really get mad. And uh, I just snapped a picture. And, you know, then I, I made a, I put a chef's hat on her. And then I had it made into an apron. So I thought I'd throw this in here if you have anybody that you want to make an apron, uh, you know, a kitchen apron for. You can grab a photo that you have and, you know, it might be an interesting gift. So here we are at our first cooking duel. This is after I got back home. And we didn't bake when we were over there. 
um, other than her making, you know, rolls and stuff like that and, uh, you know, dumplings, and, you know, that's not baking, but we didn't do anything with dough other than making dumplings, you know, no bread making and stuff like that. So here I decided let's make some banana bread together. So we talked about this and, uh, you know, we decided to do a video call. And unfortunately, I, I wasn't recording the video call because I was just calling her on the phone to teach her how to make banana bread. So here I am getting the ingredients together. And this this took some doing. Um, and I actually <laughs> and I ate a couple bananas too many. And I only wound up with, I don't know how many bananas, but it wasn't really enough to fill up a whole bread pan, which is bad. And, you know, she... Uh, you know, over here you can buy bananas in a grocery store that already have brown spots on them and everybody knows what that's for. People, you know, Chinese people look at that and think, why do Americans sell bad bananas? <laughs> because we bake sometimes and that's what you use when you bake. You don't use a green banana to, to bake. Never tried it, but I, I hear it's not very good. So here's the ingredients and she's supposed to be doing the same thing on the other end. That's why I'm showing her, you know, every so often I would snap a picture. You know, we're on a video call together, but I'll, I'll, I would also snap a picture. So here's my banana bread on the left. And like I said, I, because I ate some, <laughs> I ate a couple bananas. Um, I didn't really have enough banana bread to fill up the whole pan, which I would have liked to. Um, but, you know, it turned out to be good banana bread. And that's hers on the right, using the same size pan. You know, I had to wait for her to buy this pan. <laughs> and then, her banana bread doesn't look quite the same as mine, even though we're making it at the same time. So this is why I think it's going to be amusing to, to, to make these videos. Because <laughs> I'll be talking to somebody on the other end who knows what they're doing, and I'll be the one that's messing up. So here's a discussion that we had. We're on WeChat together. In addition to having a video call, we can also you know go to WeChat, and I can send her pictures. So here we are on the left, it's me with all the, you know, the um, ingredients and throwing my bread pan in the oven. You can see in that picture on the lower left, the, the bread pan's only maybe two thirds full instead of maybe, you know, a little bit more full. And then here's her, hers in the second picture here. These are, you know, just screenshots in WeChat. And WeChat is like, you know, Messenger, you know, for Facebook. And then on the right, that's not that's WeChat still, but it's like, uh, you know, posting photos to show your friends. That's a part of WeChat called Moments. And so anyways, if you look at the second screen, I, I say uh, batter should be lumpy. You're going to have banana brownies. <laughs> and she says, next time I won't use a mixer. <laughs> you know, we went over this. I told her not to use a mixer. See how lumpy mine was before putting it in the oven? Yes, that's why I used a mixer. <laughs> so... I didn't know she was using a mixer, you know, her mixer is not real loud <laughs> and she was using a mixer. So on the right, she posted this thing, Yang's versus Robert's banana bread. Um, more suitable for making buns. The, the gap is big. She said between, you know, her banana bread and my banana bread. <laughs> so she got pictures of both of them. She posted to her friends on, on WeChat. Then. You know, after she's done, she's got these, you know, banana brownies and they're not cooked. <laughs> so she sends me these messages. Awkward. You know, we're, we're talking about this, too, but I don't remember what we're talking about. I just remember these postings because I had I took snapshots of them. And, you know, I told her maybe she can put them in a microwave. Put the, I think I said, like, try to put a couple of slices in a microwave and put it on real low, like 50%, and cook it for, like, a minute and see what happens. Maybe they'll rise. You know, maybe something good will happen. And I said, that's not a microwave, baby. <laughs> you should have split it down the middle. She goes, you know what? What? It tastes like a drug. <laughs> like medicine. So I know what she's talking about here. You know, when you burn toast, it's just carbon. It doesn't taste like anything. But sometimes when you burn stuff, um, I never burnt banana bread before, but I remember burning something and it gets this medicine-y taste. And I don't understand what that is. Maybe somebody can add that to the comments, but it actually does taste like some kind of medicine, you know, and I, I don't know what it is. That, you know, obviously banana bread makes it taste like you know, if you overcook it, it tastes medicine-y. 
But I don't know if it's the ingredients or the bananas, but I've tasted it before, so I know what she means. So on her end product on the right, <laughs> she just burnt the banana brownies now. <laughs> so, and they were hard as a rock, and she doesn't have a dog, so they just went in the trash. So this is the original cooking duel. And it was kind of funny. And it would be even funnier if I had recorded it instead of just, you know, making a video call. So that's how we're going to start out, and it's going to be like me and probably somebody in China, but maybe not. Maybe somewhere else. And this is, you know, this for some reason, you know, Chinese food doesn't get as much praise in the world as maybe it should because of countries like Thailand and Vietnam, where food is maybe a little more exciting than in China. But if you really want to learn about Chinese cooking, this is really a really good video series to watch. And it's called A Bite of China, and this one's only one minute long. You can look up Bite of China on YouTube and see this one-minute trailer. Um, I have the... I guess that's the address right there of the one minute trailer. So if you can copy that down or just copy down the last part, the P0BX3 part, and you look for that video, you'll find this. Or you can look the title up, which is A Bite of China Official Trailer, A Culinary and Spiritual Journey Through China. So in this video series, there's about 12 of them or maybe a little more. And they came out in Chinese first and I watched it and it had English subtitles. Then they came out later in English. So I, I've watched them twice. And they go over the seven tastes of China. And, and we, you know, over here now, like, you know, you can't go to a city in the United States that doesn't have a Chinese restaurant. No matter how small the city is, you know, there's always a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> Even when you're... When you're driving miles through nowhere and there's a gas station, you pull over and then there's, you know, a Taco Bell and a Chinese restaurant across the street. <laughs> so we have, you know, food in our Chinese restaurants that have nothing to do with China, like Kung Pao chicken. It doesn't exist in China. It's just something some American dreamed up. Um, but, you know, we also know of, you know, dishes like from Sichuan and from, you know, Hunan. And... If you're over in China, the Hunan dishes and the Sichuan dishes aren't just in the province. So there's a province of Sichuan, there's a province called Hunan, and there's a province called Henan. There's all kinds of provinces. Um, but the the it isn't like you draw a border and this is you know Hunan food and then you go to the next food in the next province. Because a province is really a smaller division of China than what used to be the dynasties. And it would be the, you know, Hunan dynasty and the, you know, the Ming dynasty and the, what, what's in the northeast? I forget. <laughs> Anyways, there were a bunch of different dynasties in China. And some of them were really dominant and they had a food style. But that's not, you know... It's not by province, it's by geographical area, but now they're they're spread all over, you know, all over China. You can go to Beijing, and instead of just having Beijing duck, you can have Hunan dishes and Sichuan dishes and all kinds of different stuff. So anyways, it's a really good, the cinematography is outstanding. The number one uh, series, or the number one program, and I think they're they're just like a bite of China one. I think they're actually named like that. Uh, there's a bunch of people from a village, maybe like 20 people, 15 or 20 people, and they're going up a mountainside, and it's shot with a handheld camera, kind of like the movie 1917. And you know they're going up a mountainside, and it shows a girl. It kind of you know focuses on one girl and what she's doing. She's looking for mushrooms. And she comes to, a, you know, one of her favorite places where she knows there's going to be mushrooms and she moves some moss aside and picks out the biggest ones and leaves the rest of them because they'll be the big ones in a couple of days when she goes back. So all of the villagers are doing this, and they're, you know, they're grabbing big, huge baskets full of mushrooms. So it's the cinematography is worth watching just for the cinematography, but there's a lot, you know, it's mostly to do with food. And then on the right, this is a movie that you could watch if you want to learn about Chinese cooking. And this is a guy, this is uh, Ang Lee, I think his name is. Ang Lee. He's a famous Taiwanese director. 
So a long time ago, I spent more time in Taiwan than in China, but now I've spent a lot more time in China than Taiwan. But this is a, you know, a guy that, you know, in, in Taiwan, even though it's a different country, <laughs> we think it's a different country, they think it's a different country. A guy named Xi is confused. So, you know, this is uh, Chinese cooking here. You know, it's not like Taiwanese cooking. He's a Chinese guy who lives in Taiwan. He's Taiwanese by nationality and Chinese by, you know, by ethnicity. So he's got this huge restaurant and he's just like cooking a, like a, a zillion different things every minute. <laughs> you know, he's preparing the Peking duck and he's making some kind of broth for soup for tomorrow and, you know, going back and forth and slamming pots and pans around and doing things. He drives you crazy just watching what he's doing in any five minute period. And he's got these three beautiful daughters that are, you know, <laughs> way too good looking and too sexy. And they kind of start moving out of his house um, because, you know, they're beautiful. Anyways, it's a really funny movie and it also shows a lot about Chinese cooking. It's worth watching. Uh, it's called Eat, Drink, Man, Woman. Then another thing that I'm going to try to do is stick to some well-known dishes. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm going to be using some lists of, you know, f foods from a country. And the reason for doing this is I, you know, I don't know that much about Vietnamese cooking. Um, most of the Vietnamese cooking I've ever eaten is in California and Silicon Valley. There's, you know, whole areas of Vietnamese people who have Vietnamese restaurants and it's mostly noodle bowls and they're, they're really good. I've never been to Vietnam. I, you know, I go to mostly countries that have uh, global corporations. So that rules out some countries in the world. Never been to Philippines, never been to Thailand, never been to Vietnam, never been to Laos, you know, just a lot of countries I've never been to. Um, but I, I, I want to make a, a dish that people know about. If I happen to call some girl that I know in Vietnam um, and she says, let's cook this together, I don't want it to be her grandma's dish that only her grandma made. <laughs> it might be good, but, you know, and you might, you know, you might brag to your friends, hey, I watched this video tube and I learned how to make this Vietnamese dish and nobody's ever heard of it. So let's keep things that are somewhat famous. And CNN does that, the fake news network. Um, but instead of going to CNN, they publish something every year called the World's 50 Best Foods, you know, 2020 by CNN. So you can go up to CNN's site. They're still maintained on the site. Um, but you know, you have that weird video stuff where, you know, next video is going to start playing right after you're done or you can go to YouTube. I think this is a Russian guy. Yeah. And, and, and Kovsky and Kovsky. So I've also spent a lot of time in Russia and, uh, Russians are cool people, but this guy, this guy makes uh, a video of the CNN top foods for every year and he just has them scrolling by. So you just have to pause the screen and, you know, I took snapshots so I could, you know, show you a few of these. So in 2020, the number one, cur the number one food in the world was Masaman curry out of Thailand. So one thing you'll notice that, you know, it's the 50 best foods and the top 20 is always dominated by Thailand. <laughs> always not so much this year, but other years they, they, they'll have like, you know, four to top 20 dishes or three and, you know, four to top 25. They're, you know, Thai just, Thailand just rules. And you know that from watching, you know, travel shows like you used to watch with Anthony Bourdain back when he was around and who's the chubby guy? I forget his name. Um, I forget. But anyways, there's a lot of uh, channels where, you know, you, you uh, watch food. They're, they're, you know, basically travel channels with food. And then what else do we have here? We have some weird stuff. Neapolitan Neapolitan pizza from Italy. So nobody nobody in the world eats Italian pizza. You know, people eat American pizza. Italian pizza is, you know, a flatbread with bright red tomato paste and blobs of gooey, wet mozzarella cheese and some kind of other, you know, looks like basil leaves on here, some other kind of, you know, vegetable thing. And that's what they call pizza. But, you know, the the truth is, if you watch some of the history channels on the, you know, there's a, the history channel did a thing on the, the history of pizza. And basically, it started out the same in the United States and, and in Italy. 
it's flatbread with tomato paste on it, and it was made for the poor people, you know. And then they pizza started developing different ways in the two different countries, and even in the U.S., you know, your your Chicago style pizza and your New York style pizza are completely different things. But most of the world eats American pizza with dried, you know, browned mozzarella cheese on the top, and you know. So, and then they have chocolate from Mexico. So this is getting a little bit political too because it's CNN. Sushi from Japan makes sense, except for those are California rolls. <laughs> um, then we have Peking duck. I tried making that once. I'll never do it again. Peking duck is like some grease monster in your oven spitting all over the place. Your oven will never be the same. You may as well throw your oven away and get a new one when you fix Peking duck. Hamburger from Germany. Whatever. And then... Uh, you know, we have some Assam laksa from Malaysia. And Tom Yum Gung, which is uh, Thailand, which is uh, a dish I've seen made before, but I haven't made it yet. And it we'll get to this girl who I follow in a minute or two. Ice cream global. And then chicken mwamba from Gabun, Gabon, Gabon. And then rendang from Indonesia, which was number one a couple years ago, and I've made that before. And I actually have an Indonesian girl in town here, and she's beautiful. And uh, maybe I'll... She has the same problem, though, with her kitchen. So maybe we'll do something with her visiting here, and we'll have a split-screen video where we're both <laughs> next to each other. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Anyways, that'll be entertaining. So anyways, the, the reason I go off of some kind of list is to make sure that I don't teach you and that I don't learn some obscure thing that nobody's ever heard of before. Then we have Pylin. So Pylin is who I follow. I I had this uh, Thai girl. She was, uh, um, you know, I called her the Thai genius. because Why? Because she, she got her MBA from the University of Hong Kong at age 19 <laughs> so she was a genius I, you know I, I think sometimes I'm pretty smart because I have a couple of grad degrees and you know um, I've been you know traveling around the world consulting for you know decades but I graduated high school on time <laughs> I didn't I didn't graduate high school when I was 13 <laughs> so anyways that girl um, recommended pile in here so I've been following her ever since so maybe I've been following her for six years now, something like that. I have her cookbook, Hot Thai Kitchen, and she's, you know, I I noticed that I <laughs> looked her up on YouTube wrong. Uh, Pylon's Hot Tat <laughs> That Kitchen instead of Thai, T-H-A-I. I spelled it wrong and still found her. So this is Pylon's Kitchen, and she's got like a gazillion followers, and she wouldn't have time for me, so I don't, you know, I've never bothered her. But uh, she does cooking videos. And the reason I put her in here is just on the next page, I, I kind of followed the progression of her cooking setups. So if you if you wanted to do this too and make a cooking video, there's guidelines that you can follow. So that's her on the lower right. And her, her and her husband just moved into a new house not long ago, maybe two years ago. And they live in Vancouver. And they have a baby now. And you'll see on the next page that things were getting a little hectic in their house. So they rented a place just for cooking. And it's not ideal. Because why? Because you should be cooking in front of you. And you can see her range hood isn't behind her. <laughs> so wherever they're renting, they're putting a lot of grease on the ceiling. So this is her. And, you know, I did something really crazy here that took me hours. Is I went back and looked at her old videos from, from YouTube. And I took screenshots. <laughs> And if I was smart, and if you wanted to see some of these setups, just look up Pylon's Kitchen and go to Images, and you'll see some of these same same screen captures or same kitchens. So that's her on the upper left when she was going to culinary school in the San Francisco area. And then these other, like the shot behind it, is one of her early things. And the one on the bottom left, I think, is her one of her earliest cooking videos where she's actually cooking behind her, which is not ideal. You know, if you want to show people cooking, uh, then eventually you're going to have to turn your back and grab sauces and stuff like that, and that's just not, you know, ideal. 
and you can see some other setups. She's on a peninsula in the middle here, and then the one in the the, the middle and the bottom. Um, she's just going through the uh, ingredient process here, sitting at a kitchen table. You know, so the ideal thing is to have a cook to be cooking in front of you, so that people can see. So you can see their new home in Vancouver now is the upper right picture. And, you know, like I said, they had a baby. And, you know, as you get better making videos, you get professional lighting equipment. I have some because I just have everything. <laughs> and uh, I have professional lighting and I'm working on getting a professional camera. Um, in the meantime, I have something pretty good to shoot video with. And then, you know, the the lighting and then the sound is just like a, you know, just at least use a lapel mic. That's probably the best thing to use instead of a boom mic because your boom will, you know, be in the grease. So, um, like I said, they, they had that uh, upper right picture and things were just getting a little bit too crowded with all this professional equipment. And that's why they rented a place for cooking videos because, you know, she's... She's like one of the queens of cooking now. She's got a you know a million and a half followers, or I haven't. I don't even know if I've grabbed a screenshot lately. The one on the lower right is one of the newest ones, but you can see she's got a burner on this uh, uh, peninsula or table in front of her with no exhaust, so that's not ideal. Um, you know they're probably gonna have to paint the ceiling in the place when they move out. So here I started looking for. I forget what I was searching for, but I wound up with these pictures and these are, I'm sure these are all like shutter stock. You know, these are models, not cooks. <laughs> you can tell by looking at them. They're, they're prepping food in front of them. So they have a food prep area in front of them. So you can see them, you can see what they're doing. You can see the food and you know, this is kind of getting toward ideal, but the only problem is there's no cooktop in front of them. Either, none of them. <laughs> they have a kitchen counter in the background. That's why I think these are just models and they're, they're photos I found on, you know, just searching for a photo. I forget the search term was, but, you know, like food prep, uh, you know, I don't know, kitchen food prep or something like that. So, like I said, these, these ladies, the one in the bottom looks like she's looking at an iPad or something and maybe following some instructions. But, you know, that's, that's I think that's still a model. And then we get to people who um, have successful following. So the person on the left, a stay-at-home chef, is a lady who has 965,000 followers, so probably over a million now because this is, this is an old video that I grabbed here because I had to go back in time to show her setup. So she, she maybe she has a million and a half followers now, but I've never followed her before because I, I just... Um, I mostly follow Asian cooks. You know, I don't need to learn how to do whatever she does. And But, you know, she built a studio in her basement. Her and her husband decided, well, we've got a, you know, a zillion followers. Let's make a studio in the basement. But this just goes to show they build a new studio down here and then they have a range up against the wall. And they know that, you know, it would be better if it was in front of them. But what's the problem? It's really, really almost impossible to retrofit a downdraft range top in an island because the ductwork, <laughs> the walls, the house is already built and the duct, ductwork is already built. And here you have to go tearing up walls or floors to, to retrofit it into existing architecture. So that's the reason that her downstairs kitchen, you know, the range is probably in the exact same place as upstairs. You know, and the range hood probably joins the ductwork from the upstairs kitchen range hood. You know, it just goes straight up. It's really hard to retrofit a downdraft cooktop into existing architecture. The guy in the right I do follow, Philip, and he's really good. He's a professional cinematographer, and he introduces his videos by saying he's a professional cinematographer who also likes to cook, and he likes to show cooking videos. But again, He's got the same problem where his range is behind him. And most people are going to have that kind of setup. You know, very few people have a really big kitchen with an island and, a, you know, a cooktop in the island. So my wife and I, my former wife, um, we designed this place. And we and that's what we wanted, a cooktop in the island. Now, I didn't know at the time why I wanted that. <laughs> I just thought it was pretty cool. So that's what we got. And here you can see a bunch of professional chefs. 
And, you know, they can, some of these uh, setups here are, uh, you know, I, I think they're all studios. Like the the top left, too, you can see there's windows and an outdoor, but you, you can fake that, <laughs> you know. You can have, a you know, just an outdoor um, painting or, you know, something five feet away from the windows, and that's the end of things. So I, I think these are studios made to look like a house, made to look like a kitchen. But the key here is they're behind their cooktop. And in all of these pictures, they're behind their cooktop. And that's the way you should do things. You know, you you have a food prep area in front of you. You have the cooktop in front of you. You can talk about things. You can zoom in on what you're doing. And, you know, that's what the pros do. You know, they cook food in front of them. And then you can see them cooking food and then here you can see a bunch of professional chefs and you know they can some of these uh, setups here are uh, you know I, I think they're all studios like the the top left too you can see there's windows and an outdoor but you, you can fake that <laughs> you know you can have a you know just an outdoor um, painting or you know something five feet away from the windows and that's the end of things so I, I think these are studios made to look like a house made to look like a kitchen but the key here is they're behind their cooktop and in all of these pictures they're behind their cooktop and that's the way you should do things you know you you have a food prep area in front of you you have the cooktop in front of you you can talk about things you can zoom in on what you're doing and you know that's what the pros do you know, they cook food in front of them, and then you can see them cooking food. So here we have the host kitchen. So this will be the kitchen I'll be using on my end. This is my kitchen. It's a really big kitchen. These photos don't even show how big it is. It's it's a really good sized kitchen. And the, the cooktop you can see is on an island with a downdraft, and it's you know, perfectly suitable for this, um, you know, for making videos. Dinners in Asia. I have hundreds of photos of dinners in China, from Beijing, Shenzhen, Shanghai. I still need to go through them all to get a decent list of dishes that I want to make for cooking duels. So I just grab some here without too much thought. I just, you know, th there's thousands of pictures to look through. <laughs> So some of these things I'm just thinking about trying, you know, as, you know, as uh, maybe I'll try to be the teacher and cook some and uh, teach somebody on the other end. Or maybe I'll be the learner and, and uh, you know, learn from somebody on the other end. So these are some of the dishes. So this is a spinach pastry, which is I'm, I'm going to have to look it up and figure out how to cook it. And this is something that the lovely Ruby picked out. Ruby is, uh, she's, she's like, she goes back and forth between looking like a cute little girl, like she could be a, you know, 12 year old and then looking super sexy. And she's got these crazy micro expressions for everything she does. She's changes, she changes the expression on her face every couple seconds. And it's just, I, I thought she should have been a movie star. Matter of fact, when we were out many times, you know, in shopping malls or in restaurants, people would ask me or ask her if she's a movie star or a model or something. And this is Ruby again. This is a, a dim sum. I don't have any steamers at home. And this is bok choy and another thing of dim sum. So I don't have any steamers, but someday I want to try this. I'll see, you know, uh, be something else to buy. I'm sure it's pretty cheap on eBay, though. But, you know, this might be something better if I had somebody here <laughs> to teach me instead of doing dim sum for the first time, steaming it and, you know, wondering if I'm doing it right. Scallops, again, by Ruby. This was a really, really good dish on the right here. Um, something that I just remember and some... This is a restaurant. This is a, a friend of hers um, in the striped outfit. And she, she invited two of her little 
friends from uh, work. Ruby is kind of a uh, like she re she reports to a you know a managing director guy, and he can't do anything without her. <laughs> he has to call her every few minutes. So this is uh, the lower left picture is just some bigger steamed things and some other grilled pieces of meat. But I'll, uh, I know what that is, but I can't think of the name of it and I'll have to look it up. Then back home with some Asian ladies. This is uh, Nini from uh, Beijing and she's an excellent cook and I thought I'd throw in some pictures of her. She's really super funny girl and a uh, little crazy we she's been here many times and we have a lot of fun together so this is uh nini we, we uh you know we live in an area uh there's a residential development here but right outside of it is uh about a mile away a mile and a half away is a big huge um you know business area and there's you know, hundreds of restaurants and also, you know, some grocery stores. I don't usually shop at this store. I shop basically at two stores and this is kind of a high end. This is like a Whole Foods store, except for, you know, there's a couple of these. Uh, there's one, you know, further downtown and they both have like live entertainment too. And, it, you know, so they both have an upstairs area and like on weekends they'll have, you know, some musicians playing. And, you know, other than that, it reminds me a lot of a whole food. So she's here picking out. She actually found some bok choy. And she also, <laughs> she bought a, you know, a big filet mignon to dice up in little cubes. <laughs> Probably hamburger would have tasted the same. And then a bunch of uh, big jumbo shrimp. And, uh, you know, this is kind of funny because I, <laughs> I asked her. How much did you spend on dinner? <laughs> um, you know, I was with her. Um, I was picking out some things that, that I was running low on, like some Chinese ingredients, you know, spices and stuff like that. And I w really wasn't paying attention to what she was doing. But um, <laughs> I saw her at the meat counter, and she has this big filet. And I was kind of surprised what she did with it when she got home. <laughs> Anyways, this was a really, really good meal. This was, uh, you know, filet chopped up with uh, jalapenos. So it was kind of a spicy little dish there. And uh, big jumbo shrimp and some really good soup that she fixed. So, um, you know, I'll have to try to figure out. I'm probably not going to buy a filet and make a stir fry with it. <laughs> but, um, you know, I might try this soup, which I quasi know, you know, what's in it. And this is Nini again. Um, this might be a different time of the year. She looks like she's wearing a heavier robe, bathrobe. And she's uh, making buns here and uh, some kind of meat. You can see there's a little... I, these were steaks too, but uh, she doesn't buy hamburger. So these were some kind of steaks, but they weren't filet. Um, probably ribeye or something like that. And, you know, she's making buns and this was really, really delicious. I didn't take a picture of the you know I, she's making soup too and uh you can see the bar area on the lower right is where we're gonna eat we usually eat at the bar um but uh i didn't get a picture of the buns when they were done for some reason just didn't think of taking a picture just took a picture of her doing a little magic here she really likes making buns As a matter of fact a lot of chinese ladies that i know are really good at making buns and they really like doing it even though it's, you know, it's not the simplest food in the world to fix. It's kind of complicated. It takes a little while. Uh, again, Nini making some, oh, this is her fixing the buns and the, whatever kind of soup that is. And this is Japanese. I didn't, uh, I don't think she's cooked over here. Um, and I'm teaching her how to make pumpkin pie here. So I've pulled out these pictures because I want to do this, uh, teach some Asian girl, you know, on the other end of the world. Maybe um, this girl here is uh, local. She's a, she's actually she's an engineer and a model. <laughs> what a combination, huh? And I'm teaching her how to make pumpkin pie, which is something I want to do again. I th I think I make the world's best pumpkin pie. Just the secret is just 
lots of spice. <laughs> and here's a couple other girls that I, uh, the one on the right I lost track of. She's a PhD, and the one on the left is Indonesian, and she's kind of local here, and I'm hoping to try to con her to coming over here. Uh, her kitchen isn't laid out right, so maybe we'll have a cooking duels where she's on one end of the island and I'm on the other end. Beautiful, beautiful smile on that girl. And here's a girl from Chengdu, uh, completely different cooking style here. She's making like a seaweed soup with uh, chicken, I think, and she hates to get her picture taken, and I don't know why. She's kind of cute when she smiles, but when she doesn't smile, she looks mean, and everybody thinks she's mad or something, and that's why she just refuses to get her picture taken. But I s snapped a few pictures of her. Now, living in Shanghai, there's a lot of... Uh, stuff here because I was in Shanghai for a whole year recently. So this is uh, Shanghai's Old Town and I didn't put that up there but this is a lobster bun. So when we were in Old Town we were looking for places to uh, eat and you know there's a zillion this is a really really big tourist attraction and uh, you know 99 percent of the people were all Chinese from all over China coming to Shanghai and going to the old town or maybe they live in Shanghai and they go to the old town so this is one area of town with really really old buildings and restaurants and basically the way you tell if something's really good is you know how long the line is but this line went pretty pretty fast and as we're getting up close to the, this is a lobster bun and uh, as we're getting up closer we see how it's done so they're they're making this lobster bisque. It's orange, like, you know, not like, uh, you know, New England style. Um, the, you know, the orangish type. So what they do is they, they make this stuff and then they chop up a bunch of lobster and then they, they freeze it in a little bun shape. And then this one woman just makes buns around it and then they steam it. <laughs> so that makes it hot again. So that, that's how they uh, get the liquid inside because it's basically soup, lobster bisque with, uh, you know, inside of a bun. And they give you a straw to eat it with um, or, to, you know, to get most of the stuff out. You can see there's a couple of red hair, red haired, red, red haired ladies from Europe. I forget where they were from. I kind of recognize their, their, they sounded like they were way north, like, you know, Norway or something, or Sweden. So you can see this one woman, she, you know, one woman is just folding buns all day. I don't, you know, I didn't see her take a break or have somebody else do it. But, you know, I would imagine that would make my hands tired after four or five. And she's just doing it for a whole shift. And you can see on the bottom right, tight. you know, you stick a straw in it and you drink the bisque until it's, uh, you know, not going to fall all over your plate. And then you can uh, cut it open and eat it and have all the lobster. And this is uh, Old City, too, in Shanghai. And this is kind of street food. I don't know what those little animals are. And they left in the upper dish some kind of, I don't know, let's just say they're pheasants or something. <laughs> Hopefully, you know, not rats or whatever. Sometimes, uh, you know, Chinese food is just for Chinese people. Um, some of this stuff is not very appealing to us Yanks. But anyways, we ate here. We just didn't eat any little animals on sticks. And here, this was a place that had uh, tofu and also this really good soup on the bottom right. It's uh, um, like bean, uh, a lot of you know pastry stuff in here it was really good i just don't know what it is so i took a picture of it you know a lot of times you can just look something up on the internet based on a picture and uh i'll try to find out what it is because it was pretty good and and also the tofu um you know i don't you don't want to make tofu but you can buy tofu and make all kinds of dishes with it and this was pretty good Then here, also in the old town, this is another place that had a really long line. And we actually got inside, which was nice. So in the upper left picture, we actually brought some of our own buns. And that's what you see in the package there. Um, we kind of hid it, like, you know, 
didn't want to show people were bringing food in. <laughs> and then the other pictures are the steamed buns that this guy makes. Now this is a uh, this is the old man here in the the top picture in the middle, and he's a guy that owns this place and he's owned this place forever. <laughs> and he's probably put you know. Uh, three kids through Ivy League schools <laughs> because this place is just packed all the time. And what they call these is uh, glutinous rolls or glutinous buns, whatever you want to call them. They're kind of sweet. And they're really gooey. So you basically have to eat them with a spoon and uh, gooey and sticky and good. And they have all these like sweet fillings. So the two on the bottom right kind of looks like poppy seed and actually almost tasted like it but I don't I'm not quite sure what it is and then the one on the lower left when you see that reddish color that's uh sweet bean stuff so they use this uh sweet bean uh filling in a lot of pastries and stuff so it's uh like a you know it's a real the beans are actually sweet they have a really good taste and you'll see these all over China and in, in different dishes Then, also in the old city, this was later on, we went to dinner and this place specialized in lamb, which is something I've never had before. <laughs> um, well, I've had rack of lamb, but I've never had lamb, you know, baked like this. And it was really good. You know, it's surprising in the U.S. how much we don't diversify in meat. We basically, you know, have... Um, <laughs> We have pork and chicken and beef, and that's it. <laughs> you don't see lamb very often. Um, you know, you can have it at restaurants, um, but you, you just don't go to a grocery store and see lamb. I, I actually have never looked for it, so I would imagine they have it in the deli department, but usually I'm in a grocery store late at night and the deli department's already closed, and I just buy what's outside of the deli department. <laughs> But this was really good, and so was that bean dish. I'm going to have to figure out what that is someday. But it's uh, green beans and peppers, and it's, it was a little spicy. And, uh, you know, I'll be, I should be able to look up this restaurant and find out what that is in English because I know where this place is in Old Town. I'm pretty uh, well-versed in Shanghai as far as getting around. I can get around pretty good. So this was one day we went to the towers and uh, these are crazy cool towers. They're really huge. On the left, uh, the oldest one is in the middle. That's the Jin Mao Tower. And that has a really spectacular inside because it's basically hollow all the way up. So and rooms are, you know, it's part hotel and part, you know, a bunch of other businesses and restaurants and I think residences too. So, but inside the place, when you get up toward the top, you can look down and see into pretty far, pretty far to the bottom. And then the the tower on the left is the Shanghai Financial Tower, and then the tower on the right is the Tower of Shanghai. And it uh, it uh, twists as it goes up. It's much taller than the other two. Um, the the Jin Mao Tower would be the shorter one, but it's still taller than anything in the United States. And then the Shanghai Financial Tower was the tallest how, tower in Shanghai for a long time. And then the new Tower of Shanghai is uh, considerably taller than the Financial Tower. And these are all three of these are American uh, structural engineers and American architectural engineers. So these are American buildings. Here's a picture of us up at the top, and on the way back, you have to go through like walkways and malls to get to these places, like from the traffic circle, which is an elevated traffic circle. And uh, on the way back, you know, we were really hungry because we, you know, we saved this for a really nice looking day where we thought it might have a sun, nice sunset, and we, you know, sometime we might be. You know, in Pudong, um, close to sunset, and we went up in the building and waited till sunset and watched the sunset. So you can see on the building, on uh, the picture on the right, you can see the Pearl of the Orient Tower in the background between us. <laughs> and that's pretty tall, but you know, not from not from up there. It's not tall. 
So on the way back, she wanted to try this uh, original, this was an authentic Italian place. And I said, you're not going to like it. <laughs> you know, the, the world basically eats American pizza. This pizza, this Italian pizza, it's authentic Italian. Yeah, you know, they have a red, you know, tomato sauce instead of, you know, a dark mar marinara sauce. And then they have goopy balls of wet um, mozzarella, and we don't. <laughs> so, you know, this is Italian pizza, and it's just, you have to develop a taste for it, even though, you know, this is the real pizza, according to the Italians. So many foods that are Italian are not actually Italian, they're Italian-American, including, you know, the, the pizza that the world eats is, uh, is American. And there's a lot of American dishes. Uh, you can look that up. And it, it, there's some interesting videos on what's actually Italian and what's uh, Italian-American. And here's something that I have a noodle maker and I could make this kind of stuff. But, you know, I've never tried to make noodles. I, I bought a, two different kinds of noodle makers. And this is a spicy soup, and you can see I got some on my shirt. I think that was the first noodle that I picked up and started slurping it, lost control of the end of the noodle, and it flipped around a little bit and left some red stuff on my shirt. So I, I guess, you know, sometimes it's just hard to keep clean when you're, when you're eating noodles, big noodle bowls. And that goes for, like, I worked in California a lot, and you know, Silicon Valley and, you know, the the um, Vietnamese noodle bowl places. There's a lot of those in California. This is a Japanese sushi-like restaurant or Japanese restaurant that has a bunch of stuff. And the reason I wanted to keep this and try it is these... Uh, Japanese shish kebabs because they're they're not real common you know you don't see them very often so I wanted to look that up on the internet and see if and I do make sushi at home I actually have a sushi press you know and uh, I have a sushi drawer I'll, I'll have another video called you know the host kitchen and it'll explain you know a, a lot of stuff that's in my Japanese drawer I have a Chinese drawer and a Japanese drawer in my kitchen and keep different stuff in there but I don't use the sushi press anymore. I can just do it by hand, and it's I don't have to clean the sushi press. <laughs> but I've never tried to make this uh, Japanese shish kebab, so that's something I want to give a shot. And here is a trip to her uncle's place. So she has an uncle who used to be a chef, and uh, he has various businesses now. And you know, the, every time. We, we went over to his place a lot of times. I mean, you would, we, we stayed in a bunch of places in Shanghai. First, we lived close to uh, People's Square, and then we uh, moved, uh, I forget where the second place was. And then we, the third place we moved was out by uh, the uh, Shanghai Film Park, which is way out west. And then we came back and and uh, stayed in the People Square area again, kind of between there on the western side, you know, close to the old airport. Or not really close to the airport, but we're directly in a flight path underneath it. We're still closer to People Square. But anyways, her uncle lived uh, out by the new airport, which is, you know, subway line two. And... Uh, there's kind of a trick to taking that if you want to go from the People's Square area. You have to get on a train going west first and go like two stops and then get off and get on the eastbound train and then you can sit down because <laughs> there's no way you're going to get a seat if you get on at People's Square and go to Pudong because it's, you know, it's just super crowded. It's almost like a Japanese subway. So he always fixes these, you know, crazy, you know, 10 or 12 dish or 15 dish meals and uh, just a lot to eat and a lot to drink. A uh, guy likes to drink beer. And this is a picture of a little lady friend on the right <laughs> looking like she's stuffed afterwards. And that's the way we were every time we ate over there. This is uh, Lawai Street, and I have a bunch of pictures on Lawai Street, but this is one restaurant where we picked 
I picked this out because uh, this is some food I cook at home, naturally burgers that I want to, you know, maybe teach a, you know, I have a way of cooking burgers and uh, they kind of look like this. And then also quesadillas. I make really, really good quesadillas. And uh, those are two things I might cook. And I, I have them at home a lot. And I also, um, you know, I cook a lot of Mexican food at home. And also a lot of Thai food at home. But I might try to teach a girl how to cook uh, quesadillas. And this is the film park. I don't know what the name of this town is, but it's way out west. Um, it's still in the Shanghai metro area. It's, I guess you would call it a western suburb. But this little town has such good restaurants because the Shanghai film park is huge. And it's, uh, you know, it's like different than Hollywood because it's it's like a little town that they've preserved. And the little town has some ancient Chinese homes way out in the outskirts of the town. And then they have some, you know, modern looking. They have some like 1930s, 1940s looking blocks that they just preserved. And they just build a big wall, you know, gate fences around this little town. And they call it the Shanghai Film Park. And there's always movies being made there. We we were there for a few days, and uh, you know there were there were movies being filmed <laughs> every time. Where multiple movies being filmed there. One was a you know Western movie, a bunch of you know Americans filming a movie because it's it's cheap. And if you want to film a movie with uh, you know old Shanghai, there's blocks that look like old Shanghai because it's old Shanghai. <laughs> And there's some churches there. It's really famous for weddings. A lot of wedding, a lot of people go there, couples to have their wedding photos taken. So this little town has a stretch of, you know, the main street that heads from where we were. We we're actually staying in a single family home here, an Airbnb home. And, you know, you would walk. I don't know, a couple hundred meters to get to the film park. And the street on either side had all these really fantastic restaurants because, you know, Chinese movie stars and movie stars from all over the world are eating here. So they have some really nice restaurants. So this is one where, you know, they build a fire underneath the table and they cook this stuff. And then you can see on the right, you know, we're pouring in um, some vegetables when when the fish looks like it's getting done. So basically, they'll they'll come and tend to it until the fish is done. But you know, it's up to you when you want to put in your vegetables and how well done you want your veggies. But it was really good, and you know, you got to watch. You know, if you eat Chinese river fish every day, you'll die tomorrow. <laughs> you know. It's like, I call it uh, fish-shaped uh, heavy metals and toxins <laughs> because that's what you get in China when you fish in a river. And even, the, you know, Shanghai is a coastal town. Um, you know, the airport's on right on the water. So it's, um, you know, when the river comes in, it's just as polluted as... <laughs> You know, well, the river is polluted, plus it goes out in the ocean, and you know it's polluted too because the river is so heavily polluted and it dumps out in the ocean. So, any, you know, you just have to watch how often you have fish in China. And what do we have here? Another trip to her uncle's house. So, I don't know how many times we went to her uncle's house, many times. And uh, this is, this is like a simple one, like two, four, six, eight nine only a nine course meal probably and then there's a soup always something like 10 course but i think this is just for a smaller group there's only a few of us here sometimes there were you know it would be her uncle and his girlfriend and maybe a couple of her girlfriends and then uh sometimes her mom and dad and uh than the two of us. So sometimes there was a pretty good, and a, you know, a, another couple that he, uh, you know, one of his beer drinking buddies. And this is Korean barbecue, and I've never tried this at home, and I don't quite know how I would do it. I don't have a Korean barbecue at, you know, set up. But I do have, you know, on the, the cooktop that I showed you before on the island, it has a, you know, those both of those uh, flat glass top quartz cooktops are pop out. 
and you can put in a grill. So I do have a grill with a downdraft, you know, and I could fix Korean barbecue at home. I just have never done it. So I might give that a try sometime. The thing is, you know, I don't really, I, I know ladies from all over the world, um, and, you know, and guys too, but, you know, I, I've, you know, hung out with the ladies before. And, you know, I, I don't know too many Korean girls. I, I know some, you know, my first Asian girlfriend was Korean, but, um, you know, I just uh, don't know. I don't have anybody picked out in Korea uh, to cook with, but I'm, I'll find somebody, you know, it's best, it's best to find somebody who already does cooking videos. <laughs> Something I've learned that I mentioned earlier, um, this is weeks later when I'm putting in the tail end of this video and adding the, you know, adding some stuff to the end of it. Um, but it's, it's really challenging to get good lighting and good audio and good video on the other end, even though you're dealing with somebody who's a really, really excellent uh, cook and makes, you know, these fantastic dishes. We haven't, haven't got, been able to get the lighting and the audio right yet. Another trip to the uncle's place. <laughs> so looks like a fairly small group of people and, you know, I don't know what they're three, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, no, you know, another like 12 course meal probably with soup there's always soup and this is some kind of funky looking fruit china has a lot you know they import fruits from southeast asia so you get a lot of weird stuff so i've had this thing before i don't know what you call it uh, it's kind of crazy looking um it's you know sweet and gooey but there's a lot of fruit in china that even the chinese people don't want don't know what they are so if you go walking around you see these fruit shops which are like like as big as a you know western grocery store here in the united states all kinds of fruit from everywhere and you never know what the stuff is and you just buy it and try it and another trip to her uncle's place and this time instead of taking a picture at a whole table i just took pictures of everything individually um lots of crab almost i think we had crab and fish every time we went over there and uh some interesting stuff i really like those uh pastries uh second row second picture those are uh they're not pastry but whatever they are i, I really like that stuff <laughs> to figure out what it is and just a, you know the upper left photo is uh potatoes and those are really good too and Chinese river fish. And this is back to the Chinese film park town. You know, I still only have, you know, this is only like one tenth of all of my photos for, you know, eating meals. And it wasn't like we were trying to take pictures of eating meals. It's just that some of these meals look really good and they're really unusual and you wanted to take a picture of them. And a lot of people in China take pictures of meals, so it isn't weird to get out your, you know, to pick up your smartphone and snap a picture or two. But this was really good. This was a place where, um, you know, they they came and cooked in front of you at your table. And you can see there's fish here, a couple of different fish, and a bunch of hot stuff. And it, it was really good. And this is just cooking at home. Um, this was actually the first place we stayed at in Shanghai. This is right in uh, People Square. And on the left, I think that's pork chop she's making and some kind of uh, carrots and noodles and stuff and some cut up cabbage and some fried rice. So she's a really good cook. And she, uh, you know, we, we would cook at least one meal every day probably unless we were going someplace you know unless we got up in the morning to have a breakfast maybe and then leave to go to someplace like the shanghai zoo or the, you know some some attraction like that that's an all-day thing more cooking at home this is the same place and she's making a really really good stir fry here which i make stir fries a lot at home too and I don't know, I think that's pork, maybe that piece of red meat over there. So pork and chicken and uh, 
mushrooms. There's always a big variety of mushrooms everywhere you go shopping. You know, in Shanghai, usually you stay in a high rise. We, we stayed in high rises, except for the, the film park place. That's a single family home, a really beautiful single family home. Um, but everything else was a high rise. And usually at the bottom of your high rise is where all this, the grocery stores are, you know. You just, you know, take an elevator down to the bottom and the people that rented out the, the, the basement level apartments or flats or, you know, their condos actually, you buy them, you know, they, they're they the ones that, you know, sell the fruit. They have fruit stands or, you know, meat or fish or, you know, just a, maybe just a big grocery store, maybe the entire bottom of your condo complex is a big grocery store. And here, this is uh, where this is the last place we stayed, and this was a beautiful um, place, beautiful uh, area, gated community with high rises. And you know, it's it's funny that no matter where you are in Asia, you have two burners. <laughs> you know, we always have four or five. You know, I, sometimes you wonder how they get by with two burners. So anyways, this is funny, the upper left picture here, I snapped a picture of that and it's, she's just turning around with a spatula, isn't smiling for once, she's a really smiley girl. And uh, she wasn't smiling here and I snapped a picture and then I took this picture and I put a, I put a little chef's hat on her <laughs> and I had it made into an apron. <laughs> so it's kind of funny. <clears throat> and here's, she's making uh, some kind of stir fry here. I don't know what this is. It looks like she's making an omelet on the top, but it's just a stir fry. So, um, and then some dumplings on the bottom right. I think we bought those dumplings. One time we bought. She makes dumplings a lot. You know, and they're pretty time consuming, but she still makes them. But I think we bought these a little bit faster to make when you buy them. And these are just some ladies I, I could uh, possibly look up again. I just uh, I just threw this in here for me to remind me to see who's who's available here. <laughs> they might want to do a cooking video. And that's it. That's all I have. So I appreciate your time. So this is cooking duels the way it's going to work. And, you know, the last part where, you know, living in Shanghai is just some of the dishes I want to try and some of the dishes from other, you know, from ladies coming over here and cooking things. Um, I'm probably not going to make a stir fry with filet mignon, <laughs> but, you know, I'll try some of this stuff. So I appreciate your time. And that's all I have.